I'm Matthew Ludke, a neurology resident in the Duke University Hospital Department of Medicine, Division of Neurology. I'm working in conjunction with Dr. Sarb Sinha, the residency director of the aforementioned Division of Neurology. I'm going to be presenting generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and I appreciate your time and consideration. In order to maximize your learning, keep the following learning objectives in mind. First, you will learn the nomenclature for describing seizures and be able to apply this understanding to describe generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Then, we will discuss the critical aspects of the H&P in generalized tonic-clonic seizure patients. We'll go over a rational procedure for ordering labs and studies. And then finally, we'll discuss treatment. First, the acute management of prolonged generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and then the prophylactic management of the epileptic patient. Here's a brief outline. I'll give you all a moment to read, and then we'll move on to nomenclature. Seizures, or episodes of abnormal rhythmic electrical activity in the brain, are described by a two-axis system. The first axis is spatial, recognizing generalized versus partial activity. A generalized seizure encompasses the whole brain, whereas a partial seizure involves only a focal region of the brain. Simple versus complex describes the level of consciousness lost in a partial seizure. Simple seizures preserve consciousness, and with greater complexity, you lose greater amounts of consciousness. Generalized seizures always involve a complete loss of consciousness. In addition to the concept of generalized versus partial and simple versus complex, seizures can be described by their motor presentation. In a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, you have two distinct motor phases. A tonic phase, usually with upper extremity flexion and abduction, and lower extremity extension, with high-frequency EEG findings. And then a clonic phase of low-frequency flexion and extension with a rhythmic high-amplitude EEG. Finally, we can consider the pre-ictus, a period of altered sensorium before seizure, and the inevitable post-ictus, a period of somnolence and EEG suppression, that occurs after a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Finally, on a side note, all that shakes is not a seizure. Some syncopal events, psychiatric conditions, and drug effects can look remarkably like a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, so be aware of mimics. The epidemiology of epilepsy is interesting. Essentially, seizures are fairly common, with approximately 3 in 100 people manifesting an epileptic syndrome over the course of their lifetime. That is to say, Three in a hundred people will have a syndrome of two or more seizures by the time they are 70. Even more interesting, if you look at all comers with one event over the course of their lifespan, it can reach 10% of the population in some series. The pathophysiology of seizures is diverse and cannot be discussed here in detail. It suffices to say that when considering the etiology of a seizure, you should always be thorough and run a basic list of differentials. I like to use the acronym VINDICATE to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Vascular for V, infectious for I, neoplastic for N, drugs for D, inflammatory or idiopathic for I, congenital for C, autoimmune for A, T for trauma, and E for endocrine or metabolic. Now let's move on to evaluating the patient. First, never forget your ABCs. Does this patient need immediate life-saving care? To wit, I'm a firm believer that when you see a patient, you should always ask yourself the question, sick or not sick? If the patient is sick, well, that's a different slide. But assuming the patient is stable, you can begin a more thorough evaluation. Again, we need to stop, though. Generalized, in generalized tonic-clonic seizure, means the patient probably lost consciousness. So you're not going to get a good story from them. You're going to need other sources, witnesses, friends, and family. When you take the history, ask about events leading up to the spell, on behaviors, exposures, illnesses. When you get to the spell, you need to acquire certain important bits of information. Was this the first spell? Has the patient had others? If so, how many, and how many different kinds of spells? Was the spell accompanied by self-injurious behaviors, injuries or biting of tongue, or loss of consciousness? Was there a post-dictus sedation, and how long did it take the patient to return to normal? So, 
you finished the HPI and now you need a past medical history. The patient, ostensibly, can help here. First, get an inventory of his seizure history. When did he start having seizures? How many kinds of seizures does he have? And any changes in their frequency? This will help you place the current event in the constellation of the patient's disease. Also, you need to ask about systemic conditions that affect the central nervous system. This can range from cancers to infections to vasculitides. Always ask about immunosuppression, either infectious or therapeutic. And speaking of therapeutic, get a list of all their medications. Remember, some medications can cause seizures, such as carbapenems and quinolones. But, more frequently, it's the lack of adherence to medication, specifically AEDs, that provoke seizures in many patients. Always ask if they take their seizure meds. Finally, ask about their social and family history. Alcohol, drug use, and STD exposure can all account for seizures. But, if behaviors can be rescued for seizures, families can be even worse. A family history of seizures or other neurologic conditions can really tip you off to an underlying heritable epilepsy. So, you've gotten your history. Now it's time for a physical. Yes, this is a neurology patient, but remember to do a good general physical exam. Never forget that systemic diseases can cause seizures, and seizures can cause systemic findings, so do a good general survey. For example, fevers could suggest infections. Cachexia or lymphadenopathy could suggest a metastatic tumor. Your ear, nose, and throat exam could elicit evidence of distant head trauma or a tongue lesion suggestive of a tongue bite. Ash leaf nodules on a skin exam could indicate tuberous sclerosis. And, of course, you need to do a thorough neuro exam. Remember the post-ictus. You may find your patient sedated or just not quite right. Serial exams can be critical to understanding a patient's seizures, and each and every focal finding can be a clue. Now consider your laboratory and imaging workup. All comers with a seizure should get a basic lab workup, namely blood sugar, CMP, CBC, UA, and urine toxicology screen. All other labs are discretionary. I'll take a moment specifically to mention serum prolactin. This is only helpful if it's markedly elevated and it is usually only elevated immediately after a seizure. In essence, it's rarely useful. Now let's discuss imaging and EEG. These are essentially two sides of the same coin. Imaging depicts structure and EEG depicts function. Here's a ground rule. Imaging and EEGs are only necessary for new and different spells. If it is a known epileptic patient and the spells are stereotyped, you don't need them. Regarding imaging, unless you're emergently trying to assess for a critical lesion, like blood, an MRI is more useful than a CT. EEGs come in two flavors, routine and prolonged. A routine EEG is sufficient to look for baseline abnormalities. Only use a prolonged if you have a suspicion that a patient is having ongoing seizures. Sick or not sick. Now the patient is sick and actively having a seizure. What to do? Let's pause a moment to define status epilepticus, which is a seizure or series of seizures lasting 30 minutes without return to baseline. Knowing this, let's treat the patient. First, make sure the patient can't hurt himself by patting or moving nearby objects, providing oxygen as necessary, and giving suction to prevent aspiration. Do not put a bite guard in the patient's mouth. That's a myth. Now wait and watch. You don't need pharmacologic intervention until the patient's had a seizure for five minutes, as spells that abort before this rarely become status. If you cross that line, initiate treatment with a benzodiazepine, usually lorazepam, diazepam, or midazolam, depending on your hospital's protocol. Follow this with an IV antiepileptic drug, AED such as phosphatidone, Depakote, though some institutions may also use levetiracetam or Lucosamide. You can repeat the benzodiazepine and AED load if necessary, but for treatment-resistant seizures, you may eventually need to initiate therapeutic sedation with propofol or even a barbiturate. Regardless, as you follow this algorithm, never forget your ABCs. We've evaluated seizures, we've treated an acute seizure. When do you give an antiepileptic drug to a patient to prevent future seizures?
Remember an important point. All AEDs have side effects. Some of them are significant. Do not use them willy-nilly. Here's the ground rule. Save AEDs for patients who either have recurrent seizures, patients who have seizures secondary to a known uncorrectable cause, or patients that have concerning wave activity on their EEG. Remember, our workup from slide 11, that's why a new seizure patient should get an MRI and an EEG. Abnormalities on these could force initiation of an AED even after only one spell. Regardless, a word of caution, it can be really easy to start an AED, but it can be very difficult to stop them. Use them only when necessary. Seizures are life-altering events, and you need to account for the social aspect of a seizure to treat the whole patient. First, patients with seizures need to be warned to avoid certain potentially dangerous activities. Taking baths, swimming, climbing ladders, walking on ledges, and driving can all be potentially lethal if you lose consciousness and have convulsions. You need to warn your patient about this. Also, you need to discuss medicine compliance. If you start a patient on an AED, they need to know that their compliance with the drug is essential, potentially a matter of life and death. And, if available, involve family and friends to help ensure a supportive environment. One more remark. Know your local driving laws. Some municipalities have special regulations governing driving after a seizure and may even require physicians to notify authorities. Be aware of your local guidelines. We've come to the end. By now, you should know how to identify a generalized tonic-clonic seizure and how to perform a thorough evaluation with a good H&P and how to rationally order labs, imaging, and studies. You should have a rough outline of how to treat an acute seizure and specifically when you need to acutely treat a seizure, and when you should initiate an AED, and that you ought to be doing so with discretion if you do. Never forget to treat your patient appropriately, which is to say if they're sick, don't mess around, address their ABCs. And finally, remember the social aspects of a seizure patient and treat the whole patient. Here is a list of references that you can use and peruse at your leisure. And as a final note, I'd like to thank Drs. Sarab Sinha and Catherine Ludke for their assistance and support. I appreciate your time.